Well, good evening and welcome to a special edition of the First Responder Wellness Podcast. Tonight, I have two very special guests with me, and we're going to talk a little bit about the event coming up next week in New York City. Welcome, Samantha and Jason. Hello. Thank you. Thank you so, for having us. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, too. I think this is Sam's first podcast. It is. I don't, All right. No, I don't think I've done an actual podcast. No, this is my first. Well, hey, there we go. So it's good, it's good to have you. Uh, so just for the audience sake, uh, give us the cliff notes of who you are. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I work for, uh, I'm a police officer and I work for, I'm an active police officer, so I can't exactly say my agency, but oh. I work for a major metropolitan city. I'll say that. Um, I've been an officer for 20 years and my current assignment, I work in uh, counterterrorism. And I am one of the lead instructors for our chemical, biological, and radiological nuclear uh, seaburn team. So I do all really the scary. training. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's <laughs> it's fun. I'm not on the response team. I train the response team. Gotcha. So that's, uh, that's so what I do. That's my thing. you from all the bad stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, I just I train the other people how to go there now. <laughs> right. I'm too old to be out there. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, Jason, tell us who you are. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, geez, I don't even know where to start. I had 23 years federal law enforcement. I retired in March. Anywhere from the U.S. Border Patrol to special agent with a bunch of different agencies. And I also was in the U.S. Army. I was enlisted and I was an officer and I did a tour in Iraq as an infantry captain back in 06. And I host a podcast called The Protectors. Awesome. Well, it's great to have both of you on. Jason, this is the first time you and I have met, just full disclosure, to let everybody know. Samantha and I have talked before, uh, but I want to say thank you for being here. And uh, we're really excited about coming to, uh, to New York City next week on Thursday evening, December 7th, for the New York premiere of PTSD 911. It's a documentary film. If you haven't heard about it, uh, it tells the story of first responders and PTSD. And uh, it gives some uh, three stories of a firefighter, a police officer, and a dispatcher. And we walk through their journey uh, to, to wherever it took us for this, this film. And then we talk about, uh, we bring in some first responder agencies who are doing things better than others. Uh, when it comes to dealing with PTSD, we know that's a problem. And so tell me, Jason, uh, tell me a little bit about your experience with PTSD. Well, you know, the thing is coming from the, the law enforcement and the military background, I've seen the military take huge steps compared to the way it used to be. Because mm -hmm. when I was initially in the service, it was in the 1990s. And if you mentioned PTSD or, or shell shock or whatever other types of terms you wanted to say before that, you'd hit roadblocks and command wouldn't, would never support you. So then later on, you know, as the wars progressed, you're starting to see like, you know, when I, when I redeployed back to the States in 06, it was literally a sheet of paper that they give you. And it says, Hey, you know what? Uh, do you feel suicidal? And if you say yes, well, then you're going to be stuck for another two weeks and nobody wants that. So then, you know, you see the military starts to support their troops and even senior leadership coming forward and saying, Hey, I have PTSD. I've sought help and it hasn't affected my career. Now, if law enforcement could follow that same pathway, it, we'd see a hell, hell of a lot of different trajectory for what's happening to our first responders and our protector community is because I don't see anybody being able to reach out for help, like in my spectrum, about what are the what are the results? Are you going to be going on a rubber gun squad? Are you going to be, you know, is it going to hinder your career, et cetera? So, I mean, I think the military is coming. And I think the, the first responder community, the law enforcement community has to really step up their game. So uh, thank you for that, Jason. Uh, Samantha, tell us a little bit about your journey in PTSD. Um, yeah, you know, I was in the military too. Um, I left in 2004 and that it was something that, that people actually like talked about a little bit. Like it wasn't as taboo when I got into law enforcement. Um, I don't feel like it was really touched on at all. It, a lot of the focus or anything you ever heard about PTSD, um, usually was all about the military and soldiers who have been deployed, but really it wasn't talked about 
within law enforcement. And it's crazy because I saw it all around me. I mean, I was young when I first joined, you know, I was 20, 21 years old. And when you're that young, you know, you don't even really realize that you're being exposed to these traumas that have long-term effects and you're just kind of in it. You're like in this rat race and you're just going and going and going. And there's no time to really think about it. But then as you've been on there longer and longer and you start to see people really suffer from the effects and you start to lose people you care about or people in your squad to suicide, um, that's when it starts to like settle in and you're like, wait a minute, like what's going on here? And then you see people around you uh, start to suffer, like their personal lives start to suffer and you know, you see a high divorce rate, you see a lot of people going to the bar after work and uh, using like dark humor to cope. So you you see these, these different things that we do. uh, And they're definitely not adequate. And it usually leads to some destruction in lives. And it's, it's still something that we really need to start talking about. Um, It's still pretty taboo across the board with first responders since, you know, I focus mostly on law enforcement because that's my background, but you know, the same is true for, for all first responders. They all have their own um, battles, unique battles. Um, so, so projects like this and conversations like this is like the beginning, like a grassroots movement almost to try to uh, bring a lot more awareness and um, you know, lift it up into the light. So it's not so taboo. Mm-hmm. And that's really one of the purposes of this film, PTSD 901, is to get those conversations going. And and we've seen that over the past year as we've screened this across the country and in many, many cities across the country. It has done exactly that. It's been the catalyst for conversations to begin uh, within communities. And I know we were in one community in uh, Iowa uh, on our Coast to Coast bike tour this summer, and the the police chief was there. He was on a panel And he even mentioned, you know, man, I wish I would have had my, my recruits here. I wish I'd have had my people from the Academy here at this thing, because now we can begin this conversation and, and, and and here are some things that we are going to do as a result of seeing this film. Here's some things that we're going to do in our Academy, in our, in our police agency to, to help improve things. And that's really what I hope to do with this film as we bring it to New York city is to have that conversation come into the city and to get people together to have those those deeper conversations. I'd love to see senior leadership embrace having your, your troops get help. And, you know, I say troops because Hey, you know, here's the deal. You're all part of the team. You're all part of the big network. I mean, some of these agencies are, you know, 40,000 plus, but you also have agencies that have 10, 15 people. Yep. And, you know, it, it, the whole spectrum, once you get off these highways, you know, get off route at 80, 95, 81, 83, 405, you know, once you get off these highways and you, and you get into these smaller towns, they're suffering the same thing. Sam brought up yeah. a great point about, you know, you may get into these careers at a young age. You may get a mid mid age, but you're seeing things that normal people don't, mm. you know, or maybe they've seen it once in their life and or something has affected them. And you're seeing these things and it starts jading you a little bit, just, just mm. a little bit. And you're like, well, nobody really understands you know, we, we do the dark humor, we go get a drink and then you get another drink and then you get another drink and then you're not drinking with your friends anymore. You're drinking at home alone watching the first 48. Mm. You know, you, you don't leave the lifestyle. You don't have any outlets. And hey, I could say the same thing, you know, in my career, you know, I, I went straight to the bottle and it wasn't like I was seeing things every day. It was just the, the job. It was a not feeling the like, you know, you get to that certain point in your career, you're like, man, I just wasted my whole life. Hmm. Do you think part of that is is part of uh, something I heard an old timer, a firefighter tell me uh, a few years ago? He said, you know, back in my day, it was, you know, suck it up. Here's a beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and look, we've seen where that has taken us now. Yeah, everything with, and you know, alcohol is definitely not, you know, the substances aren't, aren't the answer. I'd love to say go do yoga, but I don't, I don't do yoga. I mean, go for a walk. I'll do a walk. I mean, I can't touch my toes. Come on. And I'm sure Sam has the insight because Sam, Sam, you know, has seen a lot in her career and it's not just with, you know, she may be in a good position now where it's kind of like in a training scenario, but it's still, 
It's the, the support of management. Yeah. And that's going to look different, you know, because I work for a major city. So we, our upper management is like massive. Our structure's massive. But like you said, I think a lot of steps can be taken, especially in smaller departments um, where, you know, people can really reach the people that work for them. You know, like it's like, like you said, like 15, 20 people, 30 people, 50 people. And I think Conrad, there are, there are examples of that across the country that you're discovering, um, as you tour around. Absolutely. And, you know, sometimes it's those smaller cities and agencies though, that have the biggest challenges because they have, they have less money. They have, they have, you know, more challenges that way financially, and they don't have, maybe they don't have, uh, maybe an agency of 12, everybody knows everybody really well. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, John over here, he's dealing with stuff. He doesn't really necessarily want to talk with Jane over here because, you know, she knows him too well. So it's, that's where it's important to reach out to other agencies around in the community to have other peer supporters from other departments and other places. And I've seen that develop with some of the organizations that I've worked with. You know, I use the employee assistance program uh, in my career and a lot of smaller agencies have that. But the problem is if you're coming from a smaller agency and you're using the same billing code, Mm -hmm. the same code, when you call EAP up, you know, if management eventually finds out that, Hey, you know what? I have, I have 10 people and this person was gone on such and such date. And this billing code was used on such and such date. There's got to be backstops. There's got to be, there's got to be methods that, you know, for the longest time when I used to see counselors, I mean, I don't do, now I still see a counselor. Um, and that's one thing, you know, I just started doing again after I retired because I felt comfortable to use my insurance. But when I used to go to counselors uh, throughout the years, I pay cash. Hmm. And, you know, it sucks that if you if you have someone that's making a cop out there who's making 15, 20 bucks an hour, and then they got to pay a counselor 75 to $150 hour, dollars an hour just to keep sane and just to keep alive it doesn't make a lot of sense because they're afraid to use their insurance because next thing you know, Hey, uh, you know, officer such and such, um, do you have PTSD? And if you go, no, well on your health records here are this person, this person, that person, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. That's where I think it's important to, to get some of the, what I call bean counters to our film Mm -hmm. because they can, once they see this and the importance of, you know, taking care of people up front, and providing those resources, it's so much less expensive to prevent stuff than to try to fix it on the back end. You know, and if we can get city leaders and even, you know, our agency leaders to understand that better and to, hey, let's invest in our team now. You know, it, it's like it's like you buying a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes, you're gonna spend money to maintain that thing, to keep it running. And that's what we have to do with our, our people. These are he, people that we need to, you know, for the lack of a better word, maintain to keep them running at their prime so that they can live a long and prosperous life. And we don't have to be recruiting new people to replace, you know, the people who have stepped out because of the issues that they're facing. Yeah. Like it, it's burnout. I think burnout across the board, whether it's physically, mentally, that seems to be what's plaguing first responders. It's another reason that you see a mass exodus of law enforcement because the burnouts just reach this critical level. Our numbers are dwindling. They push people harder and harder. It, you know, the psychological stressors of being in law enforcement for the last decade, um, you see all of that taking, taking its toll. And, and with the social issues of, over the last couple of years, that hasn't helped anything at all. Yeah. I mean, it's been going on you know, almost 10 years now. You brought up, uh, Connor, you brought up something a couple of minutes ago about, you know, what they're investing in. And, you know, I'd like to say that the military is doing this all because of their heart and their, their emotions, but a lot <laughs> of it's a fiscal responsibility. Yeah. You know, it's not only the VA disabilities and everything else, but it is also having a force ready to fight. Mm-hmm. And the more times you get people the help that they need, they're going to do it. Mm-hmm. And Sam brought up an excellent point, too, is like the burnout. Burnout sucks. And it can happen to anybody and you can get that jaded, you know, I'm like, why am I going to work? Why am I going to do this? But burnout also falls onto the command responsibility. Mm -hmm. When was the last time anybody in any command 
has seen a senior leader at a 2 a.m. shift working the shift, not just rolling up saying, oh, hey, guys, what's going on? And then rolling out. Work a whole shift. Work a whole midnight. See what's going on in your people. Work a midnight in the worst district, section, squad in your city and see what's going on. And then then start getting a gauge. Mm-hmm. Talk to people. But you know what? Find trusted people that are officers two or three years in that could go out in the field, find out what's going on, and report back and not snitch. Because nobody's gonna wanna nobody's gonna wanna talk if they know they're gonna be found out. Mm-hmm. But you're gonna find a lot of frank conversations. And you're gonna find out, hey, you know what? Maybe I need to take a look at this area. Maybe sometimes people are getting burned out because they're not getting the respect that they need or they deserve, if they deserve it. I should, that's what I should say. And the proactive ones are getting beat down so much, so they don't want to be proactive. And those reactive ones out there who quit on a job 10 years ago and they blame everything on anybody spread discourse. So you, you really need to define the line, but you need to find it. You need to be fully vested in your people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I really appreciate about uh, one of the police chiefs in my film. He has said that, and he's really on board with you know first responder wellness and mental health, and for his officers. and And he he said that you know once I saw these young officers come in, pretty soon they were gaining weight, they were going through a divorce, they were having heart issues. He said that became my responsibility. It became my responsibility as the leader to to mitigate that. And so I'm going to do everything I can to create an environment where my officers can be healthy and prosper and thrive. And so he's done that with his agency. And he says, he says, we're not perfect. In fact, they're just right now, they're at a one year anniversary of, of one of their senior leaders who, who ended his own life. And so that agency, I mean, you can't save everyone, but they're doing everything they can in their power to, to provide the resources for their officers to have opportunities to be well, to take care of themselves. And it's really a model that I wish other people would follow. And, and that's one of the things that we wanted to do with our film is to feature those kind of agencies to say, hey, if they can do it down there in Garland, Texas, perhaps we can do it here in our city. And that's, that's the, really the point of this film. Yeah, the film is excellent. I saw the film. I thought it was, I thought it was great. I I think it touched on a lot of really important factors. Um, You know, one of the things where I think that we miss the mark overall is we're trying to set up all these resources. Usually that means like therapy. We're trying to get people into therapy, this one-on-one therapy situation. Um, And what I found mostly in my own battle with, uh, I would call it post-traumatic stress injury over um, disease is because it really is an injury to your nervous system. You're constantly living in this fight flight mode. You never turn it off. And eventually that damages the nervous system. It needs to switch gears to rest and recovery. And if it can't do that, you will damage it over time. And that is what happened to me. And I didn't realize it till I left the street. I spent 11 years on the street and it didn't hit me until I I left the street and I wasn't exposed to it every single day. And my nervous system started to crave it. I started to become like an adrenaline junkie. I I missed fighting. I missed the calls. My body missed it. My mind didn't, but my body was craving it. And I was like, what is wrong with me? Like, I am not an adrenaline junkie. Like, you're not going to find me jumping out of a plane or anything like a perfectly good airplane. I'm staying in it. But uh, my body was reacting. And then I started to realize like, I started to experience anxiety or I had never experienced that before in my life. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what was happening to me. And it was really just adrenaline dumps. My body was just all haywire. And I did try therapy, but the therapist that I went to was terrible. Actually made my stress way worse, told me to journal about it, talk about it Mm -hmm. repeatedly. And it made me worse. It re-traumatized me because that therapist didn't know what they were doing. And uh, I found that if we can, instead of trying to just do this like one-on-one therapy situation, if we can teach people coping mechanisms to heal their own nervous system, which is basically what I did, within a few months, I felt a thousand times better and I don't suffer from it at all anymore. And if it creeps up, because there's a lot of stressors in life, um, I just apply the same mechanisms and I... 
I can calm it. I can quell it. And I think if we can teach people how to do that for themselves, um, that's a lot easier than trying to match a bunch of people with this therapist. You know, therapy is not for everyone. Not all therapists are very good. You know, it's like a, it's a difficult thing to do and the model fails over and over and over. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. You know, when I first started going to like therapy, I, I went to five or six different ones. The first one they gave me was like a 21 year old kid. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, you're going to give me like the laundry list of questions. I eventually probably the, the last therapist I went to before this one, this one's perfect. I love her. She's great. But the one I went to before this was like awesome. It's like 70 year old lady. We, we the start of the conversation off was like, man, that'd be weird if there was a zombie attack or something like that. I'm like, okay, boom, we're in. And, but you have, a, <laughs> she, she built rapport and you had conversations. But you know, when you talk about the adrenaline dump, you need other outlets. It's not all kumbaya. You need other outlets. And yeah, booze, it seems like a really good fix, but it doesn't. You know, when I used to get anxiety so much, I would just drink so much. The more anxiety I would get, the more I would drink. And it was just, it was just killing me. And then I found out like if I compete, like I do competitive shooting now and stuff like that, or if I ruck or if I do something that's mine, that's mine, that's not like I'm doing it for other people, then I feel like it's, it's just a, such a healthy way to get through like stress. Hmm. Yeah. These things are so important for, for all first responders and for people like me, just normal everyday citizens to really take care of ourselves. And because that's when we can, we can prosper, we can thrive, we can do better. We can, we can, you know, create a place for us to, to really move our life forward in the direction we want to go. And, uh, I think that's what's important, especially for first responders these days, is to focus on themselves, to take care of themselves, to do the things that uh, sometimes you have to choose your heart, right? Uh, you really, you know, you, yeah, it's hard to get up and work out every day and do the do the things that keep you healthy, but it's also hard to not do that and go, to, you know, go, go down the, 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 the injury path of, of post-traumatic injury and, and have to deal with that every, every single day. But uh, I know we we're, we're limited on time here. We need to wrap up here in a few minutes. Jason, is there anything that you want to share with the audience uh, as a last word to encourage them to come out to the film or, or other things that they can do to, to take care of themselves? Well, I'm going to try my darndest to get out there next week, hop on the train and get out there. So if anybody comes out, you know, feel free. We'll, we'll chat up and we'll talk about the film because I haven't seen it yet. I like to see it for the first time there. And I'm really looking forward to it. And thank you so much for bringing us to light. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Samantha, any, any words to uh, the people that you know and in your area? Yeah. I mean, I would say just get out and see it. You know, you'll learn something from it. And if you don't want to go just for yourself, like, you know, this isn't for you. Uh, it is for you. But if you are in that mi- mentality where it's not, uh, do it for the people you work with then because none of us want to see our brothers or sisters suffer. And if you can recognize signs and learn how to approach them, and this starts to become something that, you know, isn't so taboo and we can approach and we can talk and we know how to reach each other and we're not afraid and we don't shut down. um, You know, that's where you'll start to see uh, change. You know, it has to come from us. It has to. Uh, So, that's like a, a big step you can take, get out and see the film and learn something about it. And you might find something, you know, that really resonated with you that you didn't expect. Yeah. So the film is uh, Thursday on December 7th at 6 30 PM. It is at priority bicycles. Mm-hmm. Priority bicycles was our bike sponsor for our coast to coast tour last summer. Mm-hmm. And Evans consoles is helping to sponsor the event and they're in the 911 space. And so we're looking forward to being in Manhattan next week and if you go to our website ptsd911movie.com you can get your tickets there and 50 percent of the ticket sales goes to support the tunnels to towers organization so we are uh, giving back a half of that half the ticket sales to that organization so come on out and uh, i'll put a link in the show notes for where you can get tickets and so come out looking forward to seeing i'll be there and some other folks will be there from around the country got people flying in from california and from Texas, and actually the, the the head of wellness for the Garland PD is going to be there from Garland, Texas. He's coming up, he and his wife, and so they'll be there as well. So 
looking forward to seeing everybody in Manhattan next Thursday night, December 7th, 6 30 PM. So come on out. I think priority bikes is providing some food. So come a little oh, bit early. I'm talking about food <laughs> and drink, so. amazing. Yeah. So Samantha, Jason, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate this and looking forward to meeting you guys in person up in New York. Ooh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for what you do, Conrad. It's important. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you guys. I apologize for making it yeah. so short. <laughs>